Oh, what a fantastic procession that was. I never believed I would live to see the day with all those steam engines going in a parade. Quite a sight. And it's hard to believe now, as I'm standing in Stockton, that in 1810, in that town hall just behind me, in that corner room, there was a dinner held to celebrate the straightening of the River Tees. Now, the dinner was put on by the then recorder of Stockton, Leonard Raisbeck. And at that dinner, it was proposed to build a canal or a railway to make it easier to get the coal out of the southwest Durham coal fields. And in fact, that dinner led to the very first public passenger carrying steam haul railway, which we now know today as the Stockton and Darlington Railway. Stockton's considerable investment in straightening the river required increased trade to pay for it. They saw the answer in a coal trade like that enjoyed by ports on the rivers Tyne and Weir. Wagonways there made it easy to get the coal from pithead to ship. Twenty miles of inadequate roads separated Stockton from the pits in southwest Durham, so it's little wonder that Leonard Raisbeck suggested an improved system. After an abortive attempt to raise money for a canal, a public railway was favoured. 1825 saw that railway's opening, and to mark its 150th anniversary, preserved locomotives from all over Britain were repaired, tested, painted, polished, and steamed across the country to Shildon in the county of Durham to participate in an exhibition and a grand procession. The first steam locomotive had been demonstrated by Richard Trevithick six years before Raisbeck made his proposal, and then was developed by many engineers using inspiration, rule of thumb, genius, and occasionally disaster, into the wide variety of machines represented at Shildon. These were some of the survivors of the thousands of engines which once ran all over Britain. From the main display, there was a side exhibition and a sign that steam engine design is not dead. Northern Rock, a prototype engine from the Raven Glass and Estdale Railway, was on show there. And the rain! It wasn't the last we were going to see for the next two weeks. Why have these locomotives come to Shildon? Well, when it was decided to build the railway, Shildon was a centre to which branch lines from the pits could be brought. And from Shildon, locomotion hauled the inaugural train. A Darlington Quaker, Edward Pease, had led the campaign to build a railway. He eventually brought in George Stevenson to be the engineer to the new company. Eleven years had passed from the date of Raisbeck's proposal to Parliament's acceptance of George's line. And because of the inflationary cost of horse fodder, the locomotive engine was considered for use on it. Now I'm now standing on a spot steeped in railway history. It's St John's Well here in Stockton. And on Thursday the 23rd of May, 1822, a procession came from Stockton Town Hall with the navvies to come down here with Thomas Maynell who was the chairman of the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company, 
here on this spot laid the first rail. Actually, the spot is where that red, derelict, rather squalid van is standing. And if I may make a point, I think it's terribly sad. This is a magnificent example of how we, the British, seem to neglect our railway history, because this is a historical spot, and you only have to look at the squalor to see the mess it's all in now. Now, on that spot, Thomas Maynell laid the first rail, and I like to think that uh, perhaps it was more for convenience than anything else. The rails were laid on the sleepers five foot apart. It was a nice round figure. Actually, the inside measurement of the rails was four foot eight inches. And that is, of course, just half an inch out from what is now standard gauge worldwide, four foot eight and a half. There's rather a nice little story about Thomas Maynell on that occasion of laying the first rail. He was a man of very few words indeed. And the ceremony took place, and children being what they are, one of the local kids decided to cash in on the occasion. And he ran up shouting, copies of Mr. Maynell's speech, copies of Mr. Maynell's speech. And he went running up from here to Stockton, into the town, and he was flogging news sheets of the speech for half a penny a time, making a bomb. And when people bought them, of course, they found nothing on the sheet. And they complained bitterly to the kid, and the kid said, well, he didn't say anything. Sadly, these collapsing buildings will soon be surrounded by new concrete roads. To ride the new iron road, the first regular passengers booked here, but later they left from local hostels. This long-used site has been studied by Stockton historian Tom Sowler. Part of the building predates the railway age. In that particular corner, we know that a cottage was there in 1823 and yeah. it faced the Gisborough Road. That is actually that bit there. That, that's the bit yeah. in the corner, yes. Yeah. And of course the existing road is a heck of a lot higher than the original level on which the railway would have been built, isn't oh, it? Oh yes, it's now called Bridge Road, but the original Gisborough Road dropped to the level of St John's Well. Yeah. It was here that the people of Stockton came with their barrels, the barrel carts, to get the water at a half near time. Really? Good and, God. and it yeah. was probably here that they came to Rubberneck, if I could put it that way, and George Stevenson, when he originally returned from uh, the pieces in Darlington, and according to the beautiful tradition of Stockton, he said to have seized a spade and said, let us dig here, let us cut the first sod, let it not be said that progress isn't being made on the rail. Sure, and of course, that was the year before Menel laid the first rail. Well, by 1826, the traffic was building up, so the Pieces found it necessary to build a small railway hotel. That's that and, part there. Uh, and is, this is it. Yes, I'm, yeah. I couldn't be absolutely positive that it is the first purpose-built railway hotel in the world, but it Don must Hill have been. It, it must have been. Isn't that incredible? Yes. It's now all derelict. Oh, it's derelict, yes, yes. Long ago the great George Stevenson was employed to build a line down from the coal fields up to Stockton, 20 miles before their time. Built his famous locomotion, realized his long held dream to open up a brand new nation, to open up an age of steam. <laughs> To open up the preparations for Shilton, a full-scale replica of locomotion was built. It made its bow at the North of England Industrial Museum, Beamish. And then to Shilton, where the town put on its finest attire. A million people were expected to come from all over the world to see an event which was a worthy successor to celebrations held in 1875 and 1925. didn't fall on the opening in 1825, but it fell on the celebrations in 1975. It must have kept the crowds down, but what matter a little rain if you've come from the other side of the world? These Japanese may have been aware of the Shilton celebration, but most Britons weren't. Even when the sun came out, they didn't come, because they hadn't seen the advertisements. 
They knew as little about children in 1975 as the general public knew about the new railway in 1825. Those who did come saw a bunch of pampered machines. The locos weren't the only things to be pampered, and that liquid wasn't for the boiler. Still, the small crowds made it easier to see the small exhibits and the gift shops were more accessible. And for the kids, there was no hurry. They could hang around and they could dream of driving a steam engine. And the dads, they could show off how much they knew all about it. Ooh, Dad, you are clever. Oh, the engine had steam, so it would go. Park with Hudson, Mark and Brassy blazed the trail throughout the land. Round the country railway companies quickly started to expand. Barfland farms and distant hamlets were subjected to the streams. As the railway men drove forward, forward with the rage of steam. This is a historical spot, Acliffe Crossing next to Highington Station. Here, Stevenson's improved travelling engine locomotion was put on the rails for the first time. It was built in Newcastle for £500 and dragged to Acliffe by teams of horses. To fuel the engine, coal and water was needed. Where did the water come from? There were no water trains in those days. I imagine they got it from the local stream. They lit the fire using a burning glass. A couple of years later, they could have used that Stockton invention, John Walker's patent friction match. With water, coal and fire combining to give life to locomotion, the directors decided it was time to open the line, just 11 days after the first steaming. They certainly needed the income. Creditors were threatening, and they had grossly overspent their estimates. Phoenix Pit at Witten Park, Tuesday the 27th of September, 1825. And the first loaded coal wagons were ready to start. Some keen and hardy souls sat on the coal for the ride. The site of the pit has been flattened, but the odd house still remains. It's now hard to imagine that scene when at 7am, 12 trucks started to roll up the Etherley North incline the first of two ridges between the pit and children. They were pulled by rope and powered by two stationary engines housed at the top of the hill. Their water came from a specially built reservoir and the engine man lived nearby. Down the other side, the wagons were joined by one laden with flour and then horse drawn across the Gornless Bridge. This was an iron bridge designed by George Stevenson and not surprisingly was the first of its type in the world. The iron sections were preserved by the Northeastern Railway and reside today in the National Railway Museum, York. Hundreds of onlookers using carts and coaches as grandstands watched the train pass to the next hill. Well, I'm standing on the Brusselton Incline now, which surely must be the most perfectly preserved length on the entire Stockton and Darlington Railway. But it seems rather strange and peculiarly British that having preserved it, we don't go and desecrate the length by putting up these revoltingly ugly line of telegraph poles right slap up the middle. Now, these are the original sleepers of the railway, and there are quite a lot of interesting facts about these. They're 18 inches square, roughly 8 inches deep into the ground, and they weigh one and a half hundred weight each. Their cost is interesting. When they were laid on the railway, they cost between fivepence and eightpence each, depending on which quarry they came from. But uh, rather than run the entire length of the railway all the way to the Tees, George Stevenson said, look, we can only far go as far as Darlington with these stone sleepers because it's going to be too expensive, the transport cost of putting them in. So from Darlington onwards to the Tees, they used oak. Now, on these stone sleepers, they laid with oak pins going down into holes in the stone, 15-foot lengths of light rail. 
Another interesting point, of course, is that they don't go right across as modern sleepers do. That was simply to give the horse a chance to walk properly when the horse was drawing the trains. So two blocks only, rather than a sleeper going right the way across. As for the Etherley Ridge, the Brusselton Ridge had a winding house and reservoir. The stationary engines were behind this arch, and bridging the track were two large drums around which the haulage ropes wound. From there, the train was lowered down to Mason's Arms Crossing and the waiting locomotion. 150 years later, the Shilden visitors waited. Well, what memories this place has for me personally. Now, when I light up just one steam engine of my own, I get hysterical, but I never thought as an engine owner that I would live to see the day when over 40 steam locomotives would converge on one place here in Shilden and all light up and take part in a parade and it was a moment which none of us in the railway preservation business can ever forget it was really the greatest moment in our lives number 910 there didn't steam up but it was her third procession in her day she was the pride of the northeastern railway the engines that were steamed were prepared well in advance the crews were given their final instructions by George Hinchcliffe, the man responsible for the safe arrival of the locomotives. Gentlemen, could I have your attention, please? We're now one day off the Grand Cavalcade, and for obvious reasons, this is the important thing that we've all been looking for. Now, first of all, during the course of the night, we'll remarshal the locomotive. I wonder what briefing George Stevenson would have given his engine crews before locomotion hauled that first train off to Stockton. At another pageant on the 27th of September 1975, the original locomotion appeared at Preston Park, Stockton. The famous engine attracted famous people, two former MPs with railway connections. Lord Chinwell's constituency contained Stevenson's Hetton Colliery, and Sir Harold Macmillan was a director of the Great Western Railway. The waving flag signalled a steam ploughing engine to haul locomotion along a short track. On its first journey, locomotion's way had been cleared by a man riding before it on a horse, keeping the curious out of the way, no doubt. That curiosity was soon turned to fear by blasts of steam from the boiler. At Shilton, just a few yards down from Mason's Arms Crossing, that first train would pass the site of the locomotive coal drops yet to be built. Then, losing one truck by derailment, it arrived at Myers Flats, a stretch of boggy land which caused many construction problems. Tons of rubber were needed for foundations, and as it settled, so the fences on the surface moved. Each time they were straightened, so they moved again. The locals, who were suspicious of the railway anyway, blamed the fairies. But the fairies didn't stop the train reaching Darlington. Now, the inaugural run of locomotion carried 550 passengers, which is a heck of a lot of people, and obviously they couldn't all fit in. The passenger-carrying vehicles were at the front of the train, so they clambered into the coal wagons and all over the other vehicles, and the train came over this magnificent bridge, which we see in the background. Now, watching that great splendid inaugural run was a young budding artist who lived in Darlington at that time by the name of John Dobbin. And in later years, from sketches he no doubt made at the time, he decided to paint the event. And the result is this magnificent painting, which really is a priceless artistic record of a great event. And obviously, times have changed and everything is different. The trees have all gone and it's all surrounded by industrial buildings now, but it's the Skern Bridge over the River Skern. Now, George Stevenson wanted to design the bridge, and it seems strange to me, but he didn't have any qualifications as a bridge designer. The railway uh, wanted to commission an extremely well-known 
architect of that time who rejoiced in the splendid name of Ignatius Bonamy. People don't have any names like that anymore, and I think it's a great pity. Now, Ignatius Bonamy wanted to design an iron bridge, and he did so, but the cost of the iron, I don't know, it rocketed, it got so expensive, and no one tendered for the job. And it began to look as though the railway company weren't going to get their bridge designed by anybody. Obviously, the bridge was built, and both men cooperated in the design. But it was made with stone, as George Stevenson had suggested. It was reported that all the town of Darlington turned out rejoicing at the completion of the great undertaking. The directors in their coach experiment must have noted the enthusiasm of the crowd and thought of the company motto, at private risk for public service. After a stop at Yarm, the train passed Preston Park. Here, the turnpike ran next to the line, and stagecoach and train ran side by side. The crowds didn't miss the significance of the fact that it needed four horses to pull 16 people, and locomotion pulled 550. The Stockton and Darlington railway line has since been diverted, but the original route can still be traced through the trees. Three hours and seven minutes after leaving Darlington, Passing 60,000 people by the wayside, locomotion halted its train at St John's Well near to the incomplete coal staves. The company really wanted to build their terminus much nearer the river mouth than Stockton at a new town, Port Darlington. Stockton's support had been necessary to the building of the line and now they realised they were the victims of a confidence trick. As this model at the North Road Railway Museum Darlington shows, the staiths were built and the line extended to its Stockton terminus at Finkel Street. But it took the threat of legal action to bring the company to heel. The company did eventually extend downriver. The new town they created was called Middlesbrough. Trade moved with the line, but that was in the future. All antagonism was set aside in the enthusiasm of that day. of the train, there was a grand procession, and I wish I'd been there. I can just imagine the excitement of it all. Led by a brass band, the town dignitaries, and a lot of very important people came up from the coaling wharves to the town hall here, and 102 people sat down to dinner. And it must have been a heck of a boozy occasion, because there were 23 toasts at that dinner, one to the king, and one, rightly so, to George Stevenson, the company surveyor. And among the toasts, there were toasts to the new railways, which were then being thought about and projected as a result of the Stockton and Darlington. Railways such as the Liverpool and Manchester, and the Leeds to Hull. And one of the proprietors of those projected railways toasted and made a comment at that dinner, which I think is worth thinking about. I quote, that facility of communication by means of railways had been fully established by the experiment of that day. Very gently and very quietly, raise steam. We don't want a pall of smoke over the place if we can avoid it, otherwise the neighbours are going to complain. I want steam for somewhere around nine o'clock in the morning. Make sure your engines are nice and clean and about 11 o'clock inspections will be made by British Railways. The drivers who are going to move the locomotives and going to drive along the cavalcade will be turning up and your engine should be sparkingly clean and from that time onwards we'll start getting things ready and moving into the bottleneck as it were, ready for the start of the cavalcade. And here's locomotion leading the parade. Maybe we take for granted the comfort of today's railway journeys, but even in 1825, the improved ride was noted. An early passenger wrote, The coach had no springs of any kind, and yet the motion was fully as easy as in any coach on the road. A very slight jolt is felt, 
accompanied with a click or rattle every time the wheels pass over the joints of the several rails and also at the brakes which occur at the different passing places and then, if anything, feels harsher than in a coach. Some parts of the way were laid with rails of cast iron, joined at every four feet. And in coming upon these, the jerks and jolts were more frequent, more audible and more sensible, resembling exactly, as the coachman justly observed to us, the clinking of a mill hopper. Side, many people had a great free show. Others paid for their seats. There were no grandstands in 1825, but if there were, would they have been placed facing the sun? one of them. We're so used to being hauled by steam locomotives that we should remember that for eight years all passengers were carried in horse-drawn coaches. And not all passengers paid their fares. The old stagecoach practice of paying by nip crept onto the railway. Drink was cheaper than the fare and passengers were allowed to ride in return for a nip of something warming for the driver. And here comes my very own steam engine, the Green Knight. The engines here were supposed to stay two minutes apart. But bunching did occur, and bunching was a problem on the Stockton and Darlington Railway when drivers stopped their trains on single-line stretches whilst they went to refresh themselves. There were reports of blockages of up to three hours duration, but nothing like that happened here. If it had, perhaps the drivers would have been fined a shilling like their 19th century forebears. and inclement weather certainly adversely affected the crowds, but nothing could detract from the thrill experienced by those who saw the procession, representing, as it did, the age of steam on Britain's railways. Evening Star represents the end of that age, locomotion the start. True, number one wasn't the first steam locomotive, no more than this prototype high-speed train was the first diesel but both represent dramatic steps forward in the technologies of their days. Similarly, the Stockton and Darlington Railway Company took the railway out from the age of the private mineral-carrying wagonway into the era of the public railway. 
So shall they ride on through glory, treasured by the passing years. Later sons shall learn their story, born of heartaches, sweat and tears. Laying the track and building bridges, lasting tunnels through the seams. Future days shall not forget the heroes of an age of steel.